Hello, my name is Amanda Trout and welcome to my Spring 2020 Honors Project presentation entitled Boxes of Self-Expression, A Crown for Empty Spaces, A Heroic Crown of Sonnets by Amanda Trout. At the 2019 Nimrod Conference, when the first prize poet, Robert Thomas, read part of his award-winning crown for those attending, I became inspired. The concept of the sonnet series was new to me then, and I knew upon hearing the twisting refrains and sharp syllables that I had to attempt one myself. Before I started in on the creation of my crown, I conducted some research on the form's history and popular variants. Kim Adonisio's 2009 book, Ordinary Genius, provides background on the building blocks of the crown, the individual sonnets. Taken from the Italian for Little Song, the sonnet shares similarity to an eight-line Sicilian song form called the Strambato, the form Adonisio speculates a poet added six lines to in the 13th century. Dante Alighieri utilized the form in La Vita Nuova, and Shakespeare began crafting them in the late 16th century amid the sonnet craze sweeping England. Time and ingenuity have seen the sonnet take many forms, from Petrarchan rhymes to Elizabethan schemes, then to no rhyme at all. Shakespeare's frequent use of the form helps solidify the traditional narrative structure of the sonnet. Present problem, expand problem, expand some more, then close with the volta and the couplet. Modern poets have even added new variations, such as the double quatrain, double tercet form of Gabriella Mistral's Sonnetos de la Muerte, or the Sonanisio, a form patroned by Adonisio herself. The most common crown of sonnets structure requires seven sonnets linked by their end beginning lines. This is possibly the source of the crown designation, as the sonnets connect to each other in an almost circular fashion. Marilyn Hacker, as part of her entry to the anthology An Exhalation of Forms, cites La Corona by John Donne as a good example of the more traditional crown approach and claims that the crown form was invented sometime in the late 16th century. Hacker later provides an introduction to the form I eventually chose, the heroic crown of sonnets. A heroic crown is similar to a traditional crown in its repetitive scheme. However, 15 total sonnets are acquired instead of seven. One line, traditionally the last, is taken from the preceding sonnets to compose the 15th sonnet. One of the most famous heroic crowns is A Wreath for Emmett Till by Marilyn Nelson, a series of 15 sonnets telling the story of the lynching of the 14-year-old African-American. But Robert Thomas's Negligé and Hatchet, A Sonnet Crown, was my first exposure to the form. The process of creating my own heroic crown has been long and somewhat arduous. At first, I had reached an impasse as to what theme to use. Fairy tales and love stories are fun, but abstract topics open up more options for variety. I eventually chose the theme of empty spaces due to its multitude of meanings and connotations. The first sonnet stems from the absence of my best friend, who recently left for Denmark on his mission. All following themes were determined based on the first line they would have, and the many variants of empty spaces available. While several were about death or places where a person is missing from one's life, others touch on the heartache of losing a fish or the empty chute where a runner is disqualified from a race. This variety is one of my favorite aspects of the crown of sonnets, since the themes are so different while still relating to each other. While the traditional heroic crown utilizes the last lines of each sonnet to compose the 15th, I chose to use the first lines. This choice occurred during the creation of the other sonnets, when I realized the beginning lines had begun to tell their own story. In addition, I felt it was easier to control the 15th sonnet through the use of the first lines, as each was the start of a thought rather than a conclusion. Writing this crown has taught me a lot about the intrinsic emotions that can inspire poems, and the way being less strict with the form can open new pathways for meaning and experimentation. It has been a learning process and I believe it will continue to be as I ready this crown for possible publication. Thank you to everyone who has helped me with this project, especially my mentor, Professor Washburn, and my mother for being willing to help me wade through 15 pages of drafts. Now, please enjoy the premiere presentation of a crown for, of Boxes of Self-Expression, A Crown for Empty Spaces by Amanda Trout. Sonnet 1. Washington Elementary, for Jacob on his mission to Denmark. I sought the empty lot, our place, 
where remains of stalled construction hide playground cement. Then cracks from youth have widened. Earth reclaims forgotten places our friends' feet once went. The tree, our tree, now lies dwarfed by our heights, even yours, since through the years you grew to, to surpass me. A lack of playground lights leaves other changes hidden from view, and my mind fills in details. The vacant field marred with footprints, the sidewalks still bearing shadows of student scrawls, blood from unhealed scrapes. The memory of us is living there, within abandoned school where we first met, a memory that left room for regrets. Sonnet 2, My Grandpa's Tree Hive by the Road. Your memory leaves no room for regrets, since you lived so full of life. You loved life with me for eight straight years, the greatest years, told in a swirl of snowdrifts, bugs, and bikes. You drove the Oldsmobile down from your house while I plastered a grin into your window watching the bees fly by. Buzzing terrified me, but you turned all bees to butterflies. Bees brought me no fear in the years you were sick, locked in a hospital bed, breathless, an endless cycle of done and death bound. The bees stopped swarming as the end of August drove them southward. I drive the Oldsmobile down rough gravel. My faded face print frames an empty home where your bright life once lived. Sonnet 3, How to Clean a Fish Tank. Take the home where a bright life once lived. Pour tainted water in the sink. Scrub first each object he would hide behind, then sift gravel. Removing any decaying food. He'd never eat. Why would he never eat? Then place the gravel back. Cup up your corpse with water, or else he'll start to smell. Check one last time for signs of life. Respect the absence. Bury body in bowl and flesh. His fins drift behind him, his final swim a dance of squirrels. The end begins when he leaves you for the sewer. You may cry only then. Return with tank in hand and place it, prepped and patient, on its stand. Sonnet 4, False Start. Her place was patient, prepared for her stand, defending champion, 100 meter sprint. She's waited all year for this, the state meet. One fierce rival stands in her way. Hair tight, spikes laced, with matched positions on the block. They leave each other with a simple smile that speaks of time trials, the cracks and smokes of starting guns. All has led to this one run, but the shot has barely sounded when shadow surges through her vision. Quiet sweeps the field. Refs take a rival's race. One spot stays empty when the shot goes off again. She runs a sprint against quick wind. Her ri favorite rival's race imagined there. Sonnet 5. The Dreamer Among Imaginations. Her favorite friends remained imagined. Where empty space remains, they reside. Though intangible themselves, each unique form bears touches of reality. They start as echo and outline, end as thoughts made coherent. She wraps air in her hand's palm, whispers secrets to the wind, speaks her mind to the speaker her mind has created. She finds shelter in invented replies until true footsteps invade her fortress and she forces her hands inside pockets, cuts whispers short with a snap of her lips, speaks nothing. Feet pounding pavement fade fast. The solitude of silence consumes her. Sonnet 6, Introvert. The solitude of silence consumes her. She lives in a universe of silence, in the absence of abundant interaction. Her heart sits in perpetual quarantine, distanced, cleansed of each thought that can't, won't understand. Her mind, a haven, lacks the judgments of others, their anger, swift violence against every difference. Silence soothes her sadness, her own anger. It's a type of meditation. Get time all your words 
and she will pay you back in peace. Give time your creativity, and she will play Utopia. An introvert believes in a world of her own making, bright with color. Sonnet 7, to the character in my first short story. Together we made a colorful world, after years of toil, of words written, erased, then written again. I wrote you a purpose, and you lived a life I could only imagine. Our journey began in a sea of white, paper pristine, daunting in its emptiness. Our boat is a phrase, a beginning, or once upon a time, a night, dark and storm-filled, where adventure flourishes. I filled your sea with vessels, black ships packed with the potential to shift your story. We sailed to oblivion and found new truths. We sailed to an ending and finally found ourselves immersed in space. Sonnet 8, Attic Boxes. Immersed in empty space, she placed herself, soul framed in perfect pictures, golden teaks, a tarnished ring from a tarnished marriage, board games that barely get played anymore. She remembers when the room was barely filled with boxes. Her husband helped her decorate, green wallpaper, a crib, a soul to fill it with more life than pictures would ever have. When pictures were all that remained, he left, for a place that would let him forget. She stayed, traded crib for cardboard, framed what few smiles she had. She hears his laugh, distance, echo of memory that takes her back to the road he crossed, to nostalgia and sorrow. Sonnet 9, Antidepressant Nostalgia and sorrow are a crossroads, and I walk the precipice between the two, above yet enveloped. I encounter each as I traverse mine's hills. A memory starts smiling, sunlight bright, riding high. Inevitable downfall strikes sudden, plunged into blue-black moons, smiles shift downward. This inconsistent mess drives me mad medication, and permanent fix for a problem that plays at permanence. White to one side, black on the other. The dividing line seems far too thin, but I sit and take a moment's smooth breath before fate shoves me one way or another. Sonnet 10, March 2020. Fate chose to shove us away from each other with an enemy made of microscopic acids. It burns through our cells and gives birth, multiplies, divides, conquers our beings, invades through handshakes, monthly meetings, and soon we ourselves divide. Everything cancels, classes and concerts. Chaos crawls through social media. We go shopping, find shelves barren. We go to work until that work is deemed unessential. We go to church until the most sacred meeting becomes a virtual meeting we forsake. Yet the virus bears a benefit. This earth is made better by our forced separation. Sonnet 11, The Absence of Shadows. Has this forced separation made us strong? Or did our proximity build our strength up? Too close, we drowned in a rain of tears and crescent gouges, in the shattered shards of porcelain that made each step a risk and the faded shade of someone's foreign lips etched in red where Nate meets neck. My neck, etched in bruises shaped by your sharp-knuckled hands that dug trenches in my softened skin. Your ring circled my finger, small manacle that bound my life to yours. I buried it under the oak tree, that place where our first date began all this. The world glows brighter now without your shadow blocking out my view. Sonnet 12, Where Faith Began The shadows no longer blacken my view, nor do I walk alone among the dark crags of the valley. I found you in white, between black lines of sacred text. For years I read with just adventure tales in mind, 
And yes, your book is filled with awesome tales of kings and wars, but I let those consume instead of giving myself up to true joy. As Matthew wrote of a man bearing sins, Mark sent him to the cross. Luke crucifies, and John sees Lord risen in three days. This story was written to change my life, and each day I'm reminded of its worth. Each day in faith brings new reasons to live. Sonnet 13, On the Third Planet I wake each day and find reason to thrive in the sweet songs sung by boundless nature, given by some higher power. He chose this land, though once its perfect fields were filled with darkness, settled like a weighted blanket over a barren landscape. There is no water, no sound but silence, and the singular being floating listless through the inky void. Some sound gave structure to the sky, the ground and shifting waters. A voice delivered fish to twist the waves, birds to wing the air, animals to receive names precise, unique. Each word spoken brought love to this planet. Each word crafted this living energy. Sonnet 14, Ars Poetica. My chosen words craft living energy through songs I score to sing and words I write in curling structure through idea creation, the memorialization of love. I write to reveal the parts of my soul that my scared inner self won't let my mouth reveal. I write to bring about justice for the ideas that inspire me to live better. Nature in its intrinsic, intrinsic forms, the battles between brain and pure instinct, emotion in the simple, distance from the most complex, I write poetry for my selfish self who desires perfection in boxes filled with potent self-expression. Sonnet 15, A Crown for Empty Spaces. I sought the empty. This found place remains a memory with no room for regrets, an empty home where fervent life once lived. This place waits patient, prepared for my stand. Our favorite times remain imagined here, silent, consumed by perfect solitude in this colorful place we made together. We filled this empty space and found ourselves at a crossroads of nostalgia and sorrow. Fate chose to shove us away from each other, made us better in our forced separation. Your shadow no longer blackens my view. Each day my faith finds me reason to live. My own words craft me living energy to box my lonely self and express me. Thank you everyone who watched this video presentation and I hope you enjoyed my heroic crown of sonnets.